Good morning and welcome to today's webinar on Business Basics for Beginning Farmers. I'm Tom Cosgrove, Senior Vice President of Public Affairs and Knowledge Exchange here at Farm Credit East, and we're pleased that you've joined us here today. So Farm Credit East and the Farm Credit System have a number of programs to support beginning farmers. Uh, certainly, uh, the support of beginning farmers is part of the Farm Credit System's mission, and here at Farm Credit East, it's very important to our board of directors and our, and our staff. Uh, so we'll touch on a few of these programs today, but really today's presentation is, is about the, the basics of business management with a real focus on financial management for a farm business. So whether you're a producer who's looking to get into farming or you're someone who works with beginning farmers, we hope that today's session will give you a good foundation, a good introduction to the subject. And we're fortunate today to have two presenters uh, who've done a lot of work in this area, with beginning farmers. And I think even more importantly, both of them have uh, been in farming themselves. So first, I'd like to introduce Chris Lawton. He's Farm Credit East Director of Knowledge Exchange. Uh, Chris develops a lot of the content from our Knowledge Exchange program, the reports and webinars on ag economics and regulatory topics. And he also works uh, closely with our beginning farmer training and outreach programs, including our Generation Next program and our Harvesting a Profit curriculum. Uh, Chris is a has a bachelor's from Cornell and an MBA from the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, worked for many years in his family's greenhouse and nursery operation. Uh, also on the panel today, we've got Gary Madison. He's the Vice President of Young Beginning and Small Farmer Programs at the Farm Credit Council. Um, he coordinates a lot of the farm credit system efforts in, in this segment. Uh, working with farm credit system institutions nationwide and doing outreach with other with other groups that are active in this area. Uh, as noted earlier, Gary has also uh, had a farming operation in New Hampshire and served as a director uh, for one of the predecessor associations of Farm Credit East. Uh, and he's a graduate of the University of Connecticut. So Gary, thank you for joining us and appreciate your helping us out with this today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris and Gary for the presentation. Good morning, this is Chris Lawton. So our goal in this webinar is to describe some key financial tools, but more importantly to describe why these tools are important enough for you to take the time out of your day to learn about them. We understand that as beginning farmers, you're probably more interested in building a farm business than you are fascinated by financial statements. And this is Gary. Um, learning how to use key financial tools is a lot like learning another language. Let's, let's call it the language of business, and our intent is to show you how important it is to learn that language of business. If you were planning to go to live in Italy for several years, you'd probably study Italian in preparation for being able to get along with the locals. You'd want to know how to ask basic questions about finding food, shelter, and clothing. You'd also want to be able to have meaningful conversations about how you see the world, what your aspirations are, and how you're doing as far as finding satisfaction in your life. So if learning the local language is necessary for a long trip abroad, so likewise is learning the language of business being necessary for your extended stay in the world of farm business. The more fluent you are in this language of business, the more likely you are to succeed. We all have some idea of what success on our farm and ranch operation will look like. Chris and I are going to make the case that by setting expectations for your business, which includes setting expectations for yourself, you'll have a much higher chance of achieving success in life. Farm businesses are typically intertwined with farm family life. And in fact, that's probably one of the reasons you're attracted to farming, because there's a special joy in having a seamless boundary between family and work that can produce a meaningful and productive quality of life. So it's pretty simple. If you want to reach your goal of running a farm business, you have to plan to make money. That doesn't mean that profit has to be the only or even the primary motivation. But if you don't make money, you can't keep doing what you want to do. If you are thinking you want to have a small business and not make a lot of money, stay at a small scale, that's fine. But you still have to have a plan for making some amount of money. Making money from your farm business allows you to have choices. If you fail to make money, there is a limit to how long you can keep losing money. Even if someone gives you a pile of money to do whatever you want, you still have to have some sort of plan to spend it and a plan to earn money by selling something. There are really only two choices, planning to make money or planning to lose money. And as you, as you think about how you're going to be making money in a farm business, 
there are three basic areas of business skills that are necessary for every business to succeed. And I've, in my farm career, I've considered myself a production guy. I like to do things. I like to get my hands in the dirt. I like to fix things. My, my best skill was as a producer doing the production part of the business. Um, it's also important to look at this list of three business skills and figure out what you're worst at because that's the business skill that you're going to need to substitute. Uh, you're going to need to bring in somebody else to help you with that skill. And most often for beginning farmers, that skill that they're most efficient in is financial management. Great. So you probably have a picture in your mind of the things you need to build your farm business like land, supplies, and equipment. We want you to think of farm business records as another essential component of putting together and operating your business. We know record keeping is the easy task to leave until last, especially in the rush of your production and sales seasons. But for your long-term success, record keeping is essential in order to make good financial decisions. In my experience, people tend to get hung up on the difference between making a plan and predicting the future. Nobody expects you to predict the weather and the exact amount of crop you'll grow. But if you don't have clear expectations, you will have no place to start and no way to plan what might happen. A lot of farmers look at record keeping as a way to comply with the legal requirement to file taxes in the spring. So at income tax time, that sort of farmers in a mad rush to collect paperwork to prove their income and expenses and end up finding out if they made or lost money only after the year is over and done with. We want you to think of record keeping as the basis to set goals for success, to measure your progress towards goals, and to find ways to get better at what you do by relying on your records to make management decisions. For example, if you, had a good, if you have good enough financial records, you'll know if you're making money on a particular crop and can decide either to get better at producing that crop or stop growing it. One of the hardest things to do in managing a farm business is to know when to stop doing something. Exactly, Gary. One of the things that I often tell beginning farmers is that you can only, your, the decisions you make can only be as good as the information you base them on. And the information that you're going to base your decisions on are based on those records. So let's take another look at those three essential skills, production, financial, and marketing, that are needed to run a farm business and see what they mean in terms of managing the day-to-day -day operations. Managing a farm business boils down to asking yourself some basic questions. In order to answer those questions, you, have to have, you need to have records. Take a look at the question under production management that asks, what is the unit cost? Unit cost is, one, is what it takes to make one thing or unit of what you sell. That could be one flat of plants, one pound of peppers, one bunch of flowers. Knowing what it costs to produce one unit of what you sell allows you to set a price at which you know you will make money. Knowing unit cost also allows you to compare your costs to other similar producers through the process of benchmarking. The essential skill of marketing answers the question, who will buy it? Just as the essential skill of financial management is necessary to answer the question of, can I pay my bills or can I make any money doing this? The five-line income statement is probably the most basic description of how a business plans to make money. Take a look at the words on the left. That's a basic formula of gross sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross margin minus overhead equals net margin. You can see we put in a few other terms you might hear, like gross sales also being called total sales or income. This five-line income statement is what you need to know to describe how your farm business is going to sell something, sales, subtracting from that how much you'll have to spend on supplies and inputs to grow or make the things you sell, called cost of goods sold, and that equals gross margin. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. And then subtracting from gross margin, the overhead costs, equals net margin or net profit. Income statements can get a lot more complicated than this, of course. But this five-line income statement, statement is whittled down to the basic equation that describes how you plan to make money. If you don't know this information for the business you're going into, you're really just going to be pursuing a hobby. Business people make money because business people make plans. Great, Gary. The numbers shown in this five-line income statement come from a small part-time farm business that grows vegetables and sells at farmer's markets, a CSA, and maybe even some farm stand sales. Everything in this example is sold direct to retail, meaning directly to consumers. 
This firm is producing crops for direct-to-retail niche markets, which is why the net margin of 10% is so healthy. By comparison, the long-term average for commodity crops like corn or soybeans is only about 4% net margin. This is a good kind of farm business to use as an illustration of farm business planning because the monthly cash flows are irregular. In the vegetable business, you have to spend money up front to plant the crop, then work hard to sell that crop months later in the future. The, the cost of goods sold, or variable costs, refers to those things purchased to grow the crop that are used up in a year, things like seeds, fertilizer, or fuel. For every additional pound of vegetables that is grown, it takes some small amount of more variable cost, for example, another seed, or a little more fertilizer, or a little more labor to pick the vegetable. Variable costs are usually things that are used up in the year that they're purchased. In contrast, overhead costs or fixed costs are those that whether you grow one pound of tomatoes or 10 pounds of tomatoes, you have the same cost. For example, you have to pay to rent the land whether you grow one pound or 10 tons of tomatoes. You have to pay the same rent. Same for things like insurance, taxes, repairs, interest, and depreciation. That's what the mnemonic dirty is all about. You can think of overhead expenses as being the things you have to have in place like land to grow on before you can even think about buying the seeds and supplies to plant the crop. Okay, so let's go back to that five-line income statement for a minute to understand why knowing the difference between variable costs and fixed costs is important. The basic formula, again, is gross sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross margin minus overhead equals net margin. So why is gross margin important? Gross margin is a way of measuring how efficient you are at producing a crop. A different way to understand it is to look at the five-line income statement by percent of sales over on the right-hand side of the chart. Using percent, what this says is that if I give you 60 cents worth of supplies, meaning the inputs we're calling cost of goods sold, you can turn that into $1 worth of sales. That's how efficient a producer you are. Gross margin is cost of goods sold subtracted from total sales. In other words, if you sell a dollar's worth of product, and it costs you 60 cents in supplies to make it, you have 40 cents left over to pay for the stuff that you need to have in place, like the land, whether you grow one pound of tomatoes or 10 tons of tomatoes. So we can see that some farmers would have much higher overhead costs if they paid more in rent for land or actually bought a whole farm. Maybe they think they need to build a brand new barn or get a new tractor. That could make for much higher overhead costs, but not really make the farmer all that much more efficient at taking 60 cents of variable costs and turning it into a dollar's worth of sales. A low overhead business is one that does not spend a lot on land or buildings or equipment, but concentrates on making money by judicious spending on the big things and energetic management of the variable costs. Either way, if you don't keep good records, you won't know if you're meeting your expectations or if you're making money or not. Remember, this five-line income statement we've been talking about is for a whole year's worth of business. But farming requires constant adaptation to changing circumstances like weather and markets. Let's take a look at how this five-line income statement can help get us through the year month by month and help us answer the financial management question, can I pay my bills? Well, cash flow budgeting is a, is a pretty simple idea. This slide shows how it works. Taking our five-line income statement, Income minus cost of goods sold equals gross margin minus overhead equals net profit. And then to that we add our checkbook. The orange lines show the balance in the checkbook at the beginning of the month, which is the starting cash, and the balance at the end of the month, or ending cash. The yellow line shows the difference between starting and ending cash, or how much cash has flowed through the five-line income statement and che checkbook. Looking at the red arrow at the bottom of the page, Ending cash from one month becomes the beginning cash for the next month. The idea of tracking your monthly cash flow resulting from your business operations five-line income statement is that you will know how much income and expense are going to happen each month and how much money that leaves in your checkbook to pay bills. Great. So if we take this chart and zoom out and take the concept of monthly cash flow and plot it out over a year, it looks like this. This may be a little small for you to read, and that's not our intent. It's more to show what a full year of records would look like. Here we've taken the annual results of the five-line income statement and divided it up month by month. If you look over at the last two columns on the right, you'll see the familiar annual 
five-line income statement that we were looking at in previous slides. We still have our familiar five lines shown in green and our checkbook balance and cash flow in the yellow lines. So if we zoom out even further, this is what a monthly cash flow budget for a whole year looks like. There are lots of numbers here, but don't worry. Look for the familiar five-line income statement in the green lines. The white lines provide greater detail, but the, the five-line income statement is consolidated in those green lines. This cash flow statement is the same basic formula of gross sales minus cost of goods sold equals gross margin minus overhead equals net margin. We've just added a lot more detail to show what's used to produce the income, what labor and supplies are, are purchased to make up variable costs, and what part of overhead expenses are paid each month. Finally, down towards the bottom right hand corner of the spreadsheet, we show the net margin in dollars at $13,959 and as a percentage or 10.4% for the entire year. And during this webinar, we're not trying to make you an expert in creating and using monthly cash flow budget spreadsheets. Our goal is to show you the tool and convince you that it's in your best interest to use it. What I suggest you do is go to the website listed here and download the live spreadsheet we just showed you and plug in some of your own numbers. What I'd like you to do is play with the spreadsheet. See what happens if you change a few numbers of income or expense so you can get familiar with how it works and get an idea of how this one spreadsheet really tells the story of what this small-scale vegetable business will do over the course of the year. Also on the website are sample monthly cash flow budgets for grass-fed beef and for pastured pork operations. Go ahead and play around with those too. You may find something uh, that you want to do in another line of business. Great. So as manager of your farm business, you're also taking on the role of Chief Financial Officer, whether you really want it or not. What that means is that you're going to have to make the decisions about how money is spent and how money is made. You can make money-related decisions without any financial statements, but that's kind of like driving down the road at night with your headlights turned off. You could be lucky, or this could go very, very wrong because you didn't see what was glooming up right in front of you until it was too late. Running your business is up to you, and we think you need to use three financial statements in order to be able to see where you are going and know where you have been. Lenders want to see three main financial statements. We've already talked about the monthly cash flow budget at length because we think it's the most important financial statement from the perspective of a farmer. That's because the monthly cash flow statement does two things really well. As a budget, it explains the plan for the business over the course of a year and as a way to track and monitor what is going on it helps you month to month by answering the question, can I pay my bills? From a lender perspective, what is most important is the balance sheet, which tells what you own and what you owe. Let's take a closer look at what makes up the balance sheet. Assets are things you have con that you own or have control of. When you're young, you generally own fewer things, but it's important to know what you own, all the things you have, your stuff so that you can take care of the things you're responsible for. Liabilities are the things you owe other people, things like loans, accounts payable, leases, and so on. So if you take what you own or control, subtract what you owe other people, what you're left with is, is what's called your net worth. Another way of saying net worth is wealth, or the sum total of what you have if you were to liquidate everything tomorrow and pay off all your bills and loans. A balance sheet is a snapshot in time. So it's going to change depending on the date at which you date that balance sheet. It's a report of your net worth as of a certain date. A lender wants to get to know your net worth in order to find out what you are bringing to the borrower-lender relationship. Getting a loan to buy a farm is really like a long-term partnership between the lender and the borrower, where the lender wants to know how much wealth the borrower is going to put into the deal and what they are willing to commit out of what they have. So let's take a look at a simple balance sheet to show what I mean. In this case, we use the same um, CSA vegetable farm that we talked about in the cash flow statement. So we took uh, a, sn a snapshot as of January 31st. In the checking account, uh, she has $11,540. She has supply inventory of $1,000. That could be things like boxes and uh, packaging supplies. She has equipment that she bought uh, during January for $4,500. And she has some leasehold improvements. In this case, the farmer is operating on rented land, uh, but she has a hoop house that she's put up that's worth 
Over on the liability side of the card, she has some credit card debt, and she has a loan of $4,500 that she took out to buy that equipment. So for total liability, she has $5,500. If we subtract those liabilities from the total assets, we come up with a total net worth of $21,540. If we look at adding the net worth and liabilities back, we come to $27,040, which equals total assets. In other words, those numbers balance, and that's why it's called the balance sheet. I knew there was a reason for that. <laughs> hey, well, just a word on how these three financial statements are used to explain your farm business idea. That's the idea of a business plan, a written recipe for how you'll build and operate your business. A business plan is really just a communication tool that allows you to tell other people what you intend to do. A complete business plan for a new farm business will include a balance sheet showing your net worth on a recent date, an income statement that shows how you expect the business to perform in the first year or two, and a monthly cash flow budget for at least one year into the future. Writing up a financial statement that shows a projection of what you expect to happen in the future is called a pro forma financial statement. Great, so now we're going into the income statement. Uh, this is the third financial tool we think you should be familiar with. If the balance sheet is a snapshot in time that tells you what you are worth, the purpose of an income statement is to show whether the farm business made or lost money during a particular period of time. An income statement might also be called a profit and loss statement or an earnings statement. It all starts with income, what money the farm business earned or received. The expenses, subtracting expenses from your income, um, are, are going to look a lot like uh, what we did in the cash flow statement. Okay, and so the simple formula for an income statement is income minus expenses equals net income. You may be thinking this, this sounds a whole lot like a cash flow statement, and indeed it does. From a lender perspective, an income statement is just a more formal way of showing how the business earns money over time, with adjustments so that one year of business performer, performance can be compared to another. The difference between the cash flow statement and the income statement is that the income statement also takes into account some non-cash items, such as depreciation and, and income sold on credit, in order to show how the farm business makes money over time from one year to the next. Depreciation is the way to account for the wearing out of equipment over time. Let's take a look at a simple income statement, again using the same farm. So this farm sold $61,000, $61,200 in CSA shares, roughly farmers markets, and then a smaller amount on fruit sales, giving the total income of about $134,000. For expenses, we had the cost of goods sold, the, those expenses that went directly into the product sold of $80,000, $10,000 in overhead, and then here we've broken out owner draw at $30,000. That gives us total expenses of $120,000 and change. The result is net income of basically $14,000. That's what that farm has to reinvest in the business at the end of the year. So these three financial statements are, are part of your business plan, and you need to understand how that you're going to explain your farm business in words and in numbers in order to communicate with other people about what your plan is to do, is, is going to be for your farm business. Great. Remember, don't get hung up on the difference between predicting the future and making a plan. Planning, particularly planning that uses a monthly cash flow business, is the way to test your business ideas on paper before making mistakes in the real world. Your ability to show a lender, excuse me, your ability to show a lender that you can reasonably plan for the future shows that you have the skill set to manage your business and succeed. Operating a farm business requires you to adapt to new conditions, threats, and opportunities on an ongoing basis. Change never stops. Managing change is the job that you signed up for when you became a farmer. So there's no question that your projections are going to be wrong. It's, you know, hopefully they'll be relatively close, but the key is that you can adjust and adapt as circumstances change and as the future goes on. As a beginning farmer, you can probably describe your dream farm pretty well, and now you know the key financial statements that your business plan should include. 
but that still leaves you with the question of where to get the money to pull it off. And for a beginning farmer, most often your problem will be that you don't have enough to pledge as your investment in the project in order to qualify to get a loan. So before we go on, I want to briefly explain two different types of investment in businesses. There's equity financing or investment, and there's debt financing or loans. Equity financing is often referred to as startup or venture capital. It's often high cost, meaning you often have to give up a share of ownership to get it. There's a relatively high risk of failure. It usually comes from yourself, relatives, the bank of mom and dad, or an angel investor. In contrast, debt financing or loans typically are collateral based. They finance ongoing operations or expansion. They don't dilute ownership, so your cost is limited to your interest. And this is where the side where banks live. It's important to note that traditional lenders like banks and including farm credit even are not really in the business of financing business plans in a dream. You're not likely to walk in with a business plan in a dream and walk out with a loan if you don't have collateral or some, in, some equity of your own to invest in, in that business. Now, there, there are lots of options available for you to find as a lender. Uh, some offer very similar loan products, and some are much more experienced in farm business lending than others. And very importantly, some are easier to qualify for than others. Your decision on where to seek a loan should be a combination of these factors. However, your ability to obtain a loan will depend most on your credit worthiness, your history of repayment of past obligations. Yes, and oftentimes financing can be a picture of multiple players, um, not just one option. So virtually all lenders and investors look at what we call the five C's of credit. Uh, which, which of those C's are, take the most priority depends on the, on the lender or the institution in question. But they all pretty much look at the same five things. So we know now the basic financial statement's main purpose is to seek credit. So how does the lender look at these tools? If you can't put together coherent financial statements, you won't even be able to get started. So we'll quickly go through the five C's. The first being character, and that's reflected mainly in credit score. Your character, of course, is much more than your credit score number. But what that credit score de demonstrates is your performance on past loans, how you've handled your existing debt, and whether you've paid it back on time. Capacity talks about your ability to repay a loan, your ability to uh, make earnings, what your earnings will be after the investment, your history, projection, and budgets, and also a, a factor of what if things don't go as planned. And it's important to consider here in capacity that off-farm income may be important, particularly for a beginning or part-time farmer. Collateral. Collateral is the lender's fallback position. Some, more, some institutions like, bank, like banks lend primarily on collateral. For others, it's less important, but they usually all take it into account to to some extent. Uh, real estate is best, but other things can be used as collateral as well, like livestock, machinery, and inventory. And it's important to keep in mind what collateral is really worth. Uh, borrowers typically think of collateral in terms of its fair market value, but a lender is going to look at it in terms of the net recovery value, which is typically what would it get at an auction or a distressed sale. So it's important to consider that what you value your collateral at and what a lender values your collateral at may often be different. Capital. Do you have skin in the game? Net, your net worth or debt to asset ratio is key here. How much do you own net of debt? Conditions are the terms of the loan, the deal. It's important to consider the length of the loan. For real estate, 10 to 30 years might be appropriate. For machinery and equipment, more like 3 to 7 years. Livestock, one to three years, and inventory really should be less than a year. The loan term should be equal to or shorter than the life of the asset financed. So, Chris, how are lenders going to arrive at a decision? Um, what is it that a beginning farmer needs to know that the lender is thinking about how they are assessing that beginning farmer? So, at Farm Credit, we typically look at the individual and who we're lending to primarily what their track record is, what their management skills are, what their past history of making or losing money is. We're then going to look at capacity because our primary interest is getting that, it's having the customer be able to repay that loan. It doesn't do anyone any good to extend credit 
if the customer doesn't have a realistic ability to pay it back. So we want to make sure that the repayment ability is there and where that business is going. Next, we'll look at capital, the financial position and financial progress of the, of the client, um, what that customer is putting into the deal. Um, and then finally, we'll look at collateral and conditions, uh, the basis of approval, managing risk, uh, terms and conditions of the loan. So sometimes it's best to understand what mistakes can be made uh, as a way to learn how to avoid them. Um, this is my new car. Um, actually, it's got a few miles on it, but one more year of payments and it's going to be mine. Um, you know, obviously this is, this is extending the life of a, uh, a loan, the term of a loan, much beyond the useful life of that piece of equipment or car. Uh, you can't get a 10-year loan for a car um, because a useful life of a car is going to be more like five years. So it's important as you think about the things that you're going to buy to use on your farm and, you, and if you're seeking a loan for them, that you're always matching the useful life of that asset, that thing you're buying, with the length of time that you're going to be borrowing the money for. Obviously, a mortgage to borrow the, to, uh, to buy land is going to be for a much longer term, uh, 15, maybe even 20 years, than a piece of equipment that might last five years or 10 years like a tr or seven years like a tractor. And that would be even uh, a, an example of an even shorter term of borrowing would be for the supplies, the seed, the feed, the fertilizer, the cost of goods sold, variable costs things, if you borrow money for those on uh, an annual basis, you should be paying that back at the end of the year because you've then sold the crop. Exactly, Gary. It can be tempting to push out the terms of loans on, um, on intermediate debt, things like equipment and stuff, because it, it reduces the, pay, the cash payments you're going to have to make. But the worst case scenario is that you end up still making payments on a piece of equipment which you've, you've already junked and, and sold and you have to replace that piece of equipment and you're still making payments on the old one. Um, you know, and the, and the key is that it really should be for less than the useful life because what's going to happen is towards the end of the life of that uh, equipment, your repair bills are going to start to increase. So you want to make sure that you're not um, shortchanging your future by pushing the term of, of debt out too long. If you can't cash flow a piece of equipment realistically in you know three quarters of its useful life you really need to think hard about whether that it makes sense to buy that to acquire that equipment another one is never borrow your last dollar uh, cost overruns happen and you don't want to get caught with a half built you can't finish because your line of credit is maxed out the lender is under no obligation to see you finish that project They've extended a fixed amount of money, and they expect to get paid back that fixed amount of money, regardless of whether or not you were able to actually complete the project for what you budgeted. So it's important to not borrow your last dollar, and keep in mind to have some flexibility. Back to that idea that uh, that I mentioned of um, borrowing money for your annual expenses, which would be called an operational debt or operating line of debt. The things like seed, feed, and fertilizer that you plan to use in a year to produce the crop or the livestock that you're going to sell. One of the great pitfalls of farm businesses is that if you have a bad production year, either you have a, a crisis in production like a drought, or the markets are bad um, and you don't sell your product for as much as you anticipated, and you have a shortfall, and that leads to a real crunch at harvest time at the end of the year when you're expected to pay back your operational debt or your operating line of credit. If you can't pay that money back, it's very tempting to roll that over into uh, your longer term debt. And a, a lender may be willing to do that in extraordinary circumstances um, with a good explanation. But as a business strategy, to keep using your short term capability to borrow money and turning it into a long term debt is a way to eventually uh, accumulate way too much debt for you ever to earn your way out of. So capitalizing operational debt, taking that year, um, those annual expenses that you borrow money for, like seed, feed, and fertilizer, and turning it into 
a longer term part of your mortgage for the whole land of the farm is a, a mistake you should try to avoid. That's right. Many businesses end up in a situation where they, they almost have to do that uh, because of some unforeseen circumstance, you know, the barn burns down or there's a terrible crop year or something like that. But if that happens, it's important to consider what is going to change so that you won't have to do it again and have the same conversation the following year. It's important to think about how, if you have to capitalize operational debt, that's a sign that something really needs to change in how you're running your business. And that means that it's time for bold moves. So it's important to not just do, not just keep continuing to fold operating losses into long-term debt and think that things are going okay. It's not a good sign. Another one is lack of commitment. When the going gets tough, the tough stick it out. One of the things that we find as a lender is that sometimes when the going gets tough, people stop returning phone calls, they stop communicating with their loan officer, and people just kind of fall off the map. And that's, that's not a good way to handle it. Um, no one likes to have difficult conversations. Oftentimes people are embarrassed if they can't make payments or things aren't going well. But that's the time when you really need to double down and communicate more than you would if things were going well. That's the time when you really need to look at what needs to change. How can, how can I work with my creditors? How can I work with my business to make things get better and to stick things out? It's not the time to start dodging phone calls and letters. So some lender turnoffs. I thought we'd, we'd kind of wrap up with, with this. Um, things that don't, don't look good to really any lender, not just us. Uh, poor records are one. Um, sometimes we see farmers come in with a shoebox full of receipts. That's not a good sign. Uh, high existing debt. Um, that's a real challenge for a lot of beginning farmers. Um, it's important to keep debt at a, man, at a level that's manageable for the borrower and not extend credit beyond their ability to pay it back. Uh, low credit scores are difficult to, for uh, any lender to loan to because a low credit score typically is for two reasons. One is that you're either your existing debt is too high or you haven't handled past debt responsibly. Um, Neither one is good, and not handling past debt responsibly is, is the, the, the worst of the two, because that creates doubt in the, the mind of the lender of whether or not you're going to handle this debt responsibly. Um, relying too much on collateral, not having enough earnings. Um, as we mentioned, for some lenders, collateral is the main, main concern that they have, and they'll just keep loaning money as long as you have collateral. At Farm Credit, our main concern is that you're, you're going to have the ability to pay that back because if not, then what's going to end up happening is that the bank will end up having to collect on that collateral, and that's not something that anyone benefits from. Uh, a low personal investment. Your personal investment shows your commitment to the enterprise. Um, if you're not willing to put your own money into an enterprise, then you're, you're asking your creditors to take more risk than you are. And again, that's not a good sign that, you're, that your business is promising. Unrealistic expectations. One of the things that we do at Farm Credit East is we, we publish benchmarks on a number of industries. They can be a good reality check to your projections and your forecasts to show what's possible in a number of industries. We, we um, produce them for about 10 industries, and they're a great thing to look at to, uh, like I said, reality check your expectations to make sure that what you're um, proposing in your forecasts are realistic. Uh, not having a plan B. Thinking about what if prices fall? What if the weather doesn't cooperate? What if a, you lose a major buyer? Um, things don't always go right. Murphy's Law, if things can go wrong, they will. Hopefully not everything goes wrong at once, but if your business plan requires everything to fall into place for things to work, that's a rather risky proposition. Build it and they will come business plans. Again, we talked about how people get into farming because they're good at production, and that's great. Production, of course, is the foundation of your business. If you don't produce a quality product, you're, you're, you won't get started. But it's important to think about marketing, and that's true whether you're wholesale or retail. Um, it's important to think about how you're going to make sales, how you're going to get customers, how people will find out about you. Um, keep in mind that unless you're, what you're introducing to the marketplace is fundamentally new, customers are already getting that product somewhere else. 
how are you going to convince them to give up where they're currently getting that product and instead come to you? It's a lot tougher than many people think, where they just have to produce the product and somehow it's going to sell. And then finally, a lack of cooperation and commitment when times get tough. Almost every business goes through some tough times, and it's important to know that your lenders and investors are in it for keeps, and you need to be too. Okay, so if you're the, the small farmer, or small beginning farmer, who's been listening to this, what you've heard us talk most about is planning. Uh, coming up with those financial statements that you need to understand as a financial manager of your business, and the ability to write a plan that's going to be a recipe for how your business is going to succeed. But there are a few other things that we'd like to tell you about what you really should be thinking about before you try starting your own farm business. And by far, the most common deficiency for a beginning farmer who wants to start a farm business is that they don't have enough equity. They don't have enough money. They don't have enough things, assets, to be able to come up with their part of the bargain for a lender. If you save your money, if you drive a used pickup truck instead of getting a new pickup truck, if you don't go out to eat every other night, if you really want to be in business, you're going to find those ways to save your money and be committed to saving that money um, in, in your time of preparation for going into business. There's nothing that makes a lender happier than to see a beginning farmer come into the marketplace for a loan to, to start building their business than to have money that they have earned in their pocket because a lender knows you're going to be, you as a beginning farmer, are going to be more careful with your own money than you will with anybody else's. Another thing to do before visiting a lender, uh, before sitting down to talk about what your plans are, is to check out your, your credit rating. The worst time to find out that you have a poor credit score is when you're sitting on the opposite side of a desk from somebody that you're going to ask to, to lend you money. You need to know this ahead of time. You need to know if, by mistake, or even on purpose, uh, there, there are dings in your credit history that would lead a lender to, to uh, look at you as someone who is not responsible, as someone who does not follow through in their obligations. And as far as anticipating the, uh, the changes that your business is going to have to uh, deal with, we mentioned that change is probably the constant that's in the farming business. You need to gain experience by working for somebody else who is a profitable business, who can show you how they deal with emergencies, how they expect and plan to make a profit. That experience um, is very valuable. Your opportunity as a beginning farmer, I mean, I know we're on a webinar, but hey, if you can get to beginning farmer meetings with others in your, in your region about um, how they grow crops, um, go on farm tours, build a network of people who are in the same business that you'd like to be in, but also don't forget about building a network among suppliers, among vendors, of people that you'll buy things from and people that you plan to sell things to. And, and finally, to look at what's going on around you, to be aware of market conditions, to be aware of opportunities, as a beginning farmer, the thing you think you really want to do today may not be what you're going to do when you enter the business two or three or five years from now. Look for opportunities always and try to turn those into another aspect of the business plan that I know you're all going to write. And another thing, when, when you, after you do start and start um, running an enterprise, Remember to be flexible and be able to adapt to, to changing realities. Um, one of the programs that we have here at Farm Credit East is a program called Farm Start that invests in beginning farmers up to $75,000 in, in operating funds that they have up to five years to either pay back or roll into a conventional loan. This is for farmers that are um, perhaps not traditionally as credit worthy uh, as, our, as our typical borrowers are. Uh, we've done more than 200 of them now. Most of them are still operating, but one of the things that we found is that some of the most successful ones 
where they ended up five years later is very different than where they started at year one. Sometimes they've completely changed their, their business plans even, you know, what they produce or who they were going to sell to or that kind of thing. And that ability to um, call plays on the fly, if you will, um, serves them really well. One of the things that's, um, that's tough, you know, your earliest change is your best change. And one of the things that's, that's important is to see when things are not going the way you planned and realizing that you need to change your plans. So with that, I'll wrap it up and we'll turn it over to Tom to moderate some questions for us. Oh, great. Uh, thanks, Chris. Thanks, Gary. Um, excellent presentation. Um, so yeah, if you have questions on the, um, on the webinar dashboard, there's a sort of a chat function. You can type those in and we'll take those and, and hand those over to, to Chris and Gary. Uh, I would also mention that a couple people asked about the handouts. Also on the webinar dashboard, there's a, there's a tab that says handouts, one of five, and there, so the, there is a PDF of the slides uh, that's available there uh, for you to be able to take a look at after the fact. Um, and I just want to, I'll start with a question for the two of you with a, preface it with a comment, which is I think, you know, Chris and Gary have done a great job kind of outlining the various uh, components of success, including in, in really focusing in on the key financial aspects of that. And, and I, I want to convey that, you know, there's, uh, Farm Credit East has resources to help with those things. So, I mean, I think they really underscored the, the importance of good record keeping. And, and that's, th those are services that, that Farm Credit East can assist with. And they talked about playing to your strengths, but understanding your weaknesses. And if that is a weakness, that's an area where uh, Farm Credit East uh, uh, financial services professionals can help. And, in, and we actually have discounts on those services for beginning farmers. Uh, Chris mentioned the Farm Start program. Uh, you know, I think that's another good resource. If you go to farmcreditist.com forward slash farm start, uh, you learn a little bit more about that program and see some of the success stories. And, and, it, and it's great because it covers the whole range of agriculture and, and even fishing throughout the Northeast. Uh, and, and, you know, these are, these are beginning farmers. These are startup operations uh, who, who had showed potential. And I think one of the key attributes of that program is that you get to work one-on-one -on -one with an advisor who is, uh, will help work with you on the record keeping, on the financial management, um, on the planning aspects of it. So, so that's another piece. And, and, and so then, I, and I think the other one I would mention in terms of our suite of services, uh, when we talk about where things can go wrong is, is crop insurance. Um, that's also going to be a piece uh, in terms of risk management, and, and Farm Credit East does have a crop insurance. Uh, agency. Go ahead, Chris. That, that's right, Tom. We, you don't need to do it all yourself. And in fact, you probably shouldn't do it, try to do it all yourself. Uh, things like record keeping, tax preparation, payroll, uh, you name it, Farm Credit East has a lot of resources available. And recognizing when you can use a hand and reaching out for assistance and things is uh, really a sign of, of um, knowledge and maturity. Sure. Um, and the other thing, too, is, you know, Tom mentioned crop insurance. Crop insurance is not just for you know, the big guys or the corn growers or that sort of thing, there's crop insurance available for a, a wide number of crops in the Northeast. And it's important to keep in mind, it, you know, it may be something you evaluate and decide not to do, but you should at least look into it. Yeah. So, uh, so a question came in, um, and I'll put it to both of you. So what avenues would you pursue if you're an experienced farmer, but you don't have maybe little to no collateral? Um, what would you... What would be the considerations as you thought about um, buying farmland? Uh, would you even consider that? Gary, why don't you take a crack at that one first, and then I'll have Chris chime in. Sure. Um, you know, if you, if you don't have the, the collateral the, or the assets uh, on your balance sheet to be able to uh, borrow the money to, to buy farmland, and by the way, um, the, the more more risky you are as a borrower, and it sounds like this the person asking the question recognizes that they, they present some risk to a lender as far as being able to borrow money for land, the better your business plan has to be. Um, so number one, good business plan. Number two, I'd look for a, I'd look for a, a partner of some kind, somebody who, um, who you know would, would go in on this deal with you, perhaps uh, as simple as co-signing on the loan, uh, perhaps being somebody that you would actually give an ownership stake in that land to as um, uh, as a, a part of the way to utilize 
the capital that somebody else has to be able to in, invest in that farmland. I, I would agree with what Gary said. That um, that makes a lot of sense. One thing is that whether it's a, say a tractor or a piece of farmland, that asset in and of itself can be used as collateral. But it's important to make sure that you can cash flow the debt service on it. Um, the ideal is if you could cash flow the debt service today. Um, if you're relying on that asset to produce additional income that you would then use to repay the loan, um, that's of course more risky because you're you're predicting the future at that point. Um, but you know, keep in mind that you hope you can cash flow the debt service that's going to result from that as that acquisition. Uh, yeah, those, those are good points, and I think I think you know the other thing is that you know there are uh, services out there. I know there's one in the, I think it's called the Hudson Valley Farm Finder. I mean, depending on where you are, you know, linking up with say uh, an existing farmer that maybe doesn't have an apparent successor within the family, uh, you know, is something being more more common, and, and you know that's a tough tough sort of matchmaking to do, but I know there are a lot of folks out there trying to help people to do that, because a lot of people who don't have a successor, they want to see their farm stay in farming, uh, and then if there are people out there with experience, uh, you know, that maybe there's a way to, you know, at least get started on that farm, and, and, and perhaps a path to ownership, so that, that might be a, a potential avenue. Um, a question, the one I wanted to lead off with, with to, to Gary and Chris, uh, Chris, I'll let you start with this one. So when you see kind of the common characteristics of the success stories, you know, what, what are some of the things, you know, if you're on a one or two that really are the things that seem to be common among those who, who are able to get started and be successful? Um, I would say a couple of key, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that lend itself to success, but a couple of key things are uh, having experience, having had a, a leadership or management position on a similar farm enterprise before you go off and start on your own. We sometimes see people that just want to start off on their own out of the gate, and that's very risky. Um, it's important to work for someone else and learn the ropes before you go off on your own. Um, having skin in the game, having uh, you know more than 50% of the equity be your own rather than relying on creditors or, or uh, debt to finance everything. Um, those are two key ones. Uh, Gary, I don't know if you want to add some more. Sure, I'd, I'd throw in their confidence. I think that you know, and I'm not talking about confidence like con man, like you're a really good salesman, although that, that may help. Um, but to be able to, uh, as a beginning farmer, to be able to have confidence that you've actually done the planning, that what you're doing when you're going to a lender is not begging for a loan. You're saying, you know, I've chosen you to be my business partner for the next several years, uh, and that's why I want to borrow money from you. It's a very, very different sort of, of uh, characterization and presentation for a beginning farmer to go into a lender with confidence rather than as uh, uh, you, you should never appear like you, you're, you're begging for the money. Uh, you should be starting a conversation with a lender, with actually with a couple of different lenders to, to sort of kick the tires and, and try them out before you actually need the money. That kind of relationship development um, as a beginning farmer is extremely important. Um, showing up in the in the spring of the year at a at a lender and saying, you know, I'd like to start farming this year. Actually, next week, uh, can I borrow fifty thousand dollars for operating costs? Uh, you're you're not going to be successful doing that. You need to have some degree of reasonableness that you're also expressing at the same time that you're expressing confidence, that you know what you're doing and you have that, that smell of success about you. That's very true, Gary. I mean, I would say ideally, um, as a borrower, you want to be in a position to negotiate a loan, not beg for a loan. Um, you, the worst thing you want to do is go in and ask for money because you, quote unquote, need money. Um, needing money doesn't necessarily lend itself to being able to pay it back. The key that the lender is going to consider is how is how is that money going to be invested in a way that will produce a return, and that's what you want to keep in mind. Uh, so uh, here's one that came in. Uh, what how would you go about determining the market value of a crop? So what are some of the resources to do that? How uh, I, you know I'm wondering if they're going in towards you know sort of its value uh, for collateral or maybe how much you should or could borrow against it. What are some of your thoughts there? Um, okay, if you're trying to you know, project ahead and think about market value is, let's say you're growing apples. 
Um, you know, look at what Apple's got last year. What are the trends this year? What do you? What's a realistic harvest amount for you? And you can use that to project ahead what that crop is hopefully going to yield. Um, that's like, and then you want to you know make sure that that's realistic for your own operation. Are you selling wholesale or retail, and where are your customers coming from, and all that? Um, Gary, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, you know, Google is a wonderful thing to be able to put a phrase in and and find uh, a budget for uh, a crop that you may want to grow. If you Google enterprise budget for tomatoes um, or whatever the crop is you want to grow, or benchmark uh, studies for uh, CSA farms. Uh, those kind of phrases are great on Google, and also it's the kind of uh, the kind of question that you should be asking uh, your local cooperative extension agent because they have a wealth of personal knowledge about what markets are in their local area, as well as being able to direct you to uh, different resources that are online that may not show up. Um, right on the first couple of pages of a, of a Google search. That's the idea of, of networking that, that we suggested in our, our uh, slide just before this one, is really finding those people who can tell you the answers to those sorts of questions. They're not going to give you detailed information, maybe, but they're going to give you the, the jargon. They're going to say, well, look up enterprise budget, or uh, They'll help you find your way to that information that you need to know. Um, that's a very important part of building that network of other beginning farmers or experienced farmers that are maybe not a loan officer right in that list because loan officers are really used to the businesses that are around them and have a really good sense of, of what's possible in a, in a given farm business in your area. And, and Gary, one thing that you mentioned earlier, when you mentioned the loan officer thing, it reminded me of something you mentioned earlier, is that it's it's never um, a bad idea to talk to a loan officer or a lender ahead of your need. Um, you know, one of the things that we mentioned is that banks are not really in the business of financing business plans and dreams without any kind of operating entity that's that's ongoing. But there's no harm in having a conversation. There's no harm in going and saying, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. What are some of the things I would need to get in place in order to make it financeable? Um, you know, a conversation is, uh, you know, it's free and it's uh, it's a not a bad thing to do ahead of your need. I think we're at the close of our hour here. Again, Gary and Chris, appreciate your comments and appreciate everyone for uh, for participating today. Uh, more resources available at farmcrediteast.com. Mentioned the Farm Start program, some of the other services uh, that might be able to help you get started. So. Uh, so with that, we're going to sign off and appreciate everyone's attendance. And I just want to put in a plug for our next webinar that's coming up uh, December 7th on grants and grant writing. This is for grants both for existing farmers as well as beginning farmers. We're going to talk about opportunities that are out there, how to find them, how to apply, and uh, what are some things to consider. So uh, be sure to keep that on your schedule.